All right, well, thank you for coming. Susan and I were just talking. We think this is the biggest barrier in diabetes, so which means you've come to the most important session at the whole conference. Uh, so, so my name is Adam. I work at Diatribe. How many know Diatribe in the room? Okay, so if you don't know it, go to diatribe.org, sign up. It's a free newsletter. We cover everything happening in diabetes. We give it away for free because we think uh, cost should not be a barrier to terrific education. Uh, and this is some work that we did a few years ago with a diabetes market research company named DQ&A. And it started actually as a conversation I had with a couple diabetes advocates in a bar. And we said, man, stigma is such a barrier. Let's do something about it. So I said, all right, what, what questions should we ask patients? And so I, we, you know, we brainstormed some questions and wrote it down and we worked with DQ&A and we sent it out to thousands of patients. And this is that data that you're about to see. And we got it accepted recently to clinical diabetes, so it'll be published later this year. And we think uh, it can make a real difference. So the topic is stigma, who feels it, what's the impact, and what can we do about it? So this is sort of the challenge we have in diabetes, right? It's this invisible disease. You can look at me and say, you know, it doesn't look like Adam has diabetes, but it has some identifiable characteristics, right? So I wear an insulin pump. I might replace my potatoes with vegetables when I order, uh, provoking, you know, the waiter's eyebrow to rise. Um, you might see me taking an injection if I use injections, testing my blood sugar. You know, so that there are, or people are overweight, so there are ways to identify people with diabetes, and this is what really gets at the heart of stigma. So, here are the questions that we were wondering. You know, do, do people feel stigma? Is this a real thing? We talk about stigma a lot in diabetes, but what is actually, what is the prevalence of it? And if people do feel stigma, who feels it the most? Do certain types of patients feel it more than other types of patients? How does it impact people? Does it have a really negative impact on their lives? Is it something we talk about but people really don't? It doesn't impact their lives daily? And then most importantly, what can we do about it? And I think that last one I'll touch on a bit, but it's really the focus of Susan's talk with more of a healthcare provider perspective. And so here's what we did. We sent a survey to about 12,000 people. This was through the Diabetes Questions and Answers patient panel. So they send out quarterly surveys to people with diabetes and they answer a whole host of questions, and DQ&A has collected hundreds of thousands of data points on people over the years. And we had a really impressive response rate, so five, over 5,000 responded to these questions on stigma, about two-thirds with type 2 and a third with type 1, so a really strong sample size, a really good response rate to understand these points of stigma. So, here's you know, the question, does diabetes come with social stigma in the U.S.? So here's what type 2 said. About a little over half of type 2 said yes, it comes with stigma. Does this surprise anyone? Does it seem too low, too high? It seems low, right? All right, now, what do you think about type 1s? Do you think type 1s feel more stigma or less stigma? Okay, I heard both. So I heard a lot of lesses and a couple mores. Okay, so type, type 1s feel a lot more stigma. A lot more. Three-fourths of type 1s feel stigma compared to about half of type 2s. Now, is anyone saying this? How do type 1s feel more stigma than type 2s, right? Type 2 is such a stigmatized disease, right? People are overweight. They don't talk about their diabetes. They put it in the closet. They're not in the online community. This is completely and totally counterintuitive, right? Who would think that type 1s would feel more stigma than type 2s? So this is where this data gets really, really interesting and fascinating. So when you break it down, um, and, and this is you know, something Susan uh, turned us on to, is that stigma is this idea of deviance, right? So there's a culturally defined norm, and you, you are stigmatized if you are different from that norm. So if you think about type 1 versus type 2, type 1 is a very visible disease, at least more so than type 2, right? So you're testing your blood sugar more if you have type 1, you're taking injections, you might be wearing a pump. Um, so it's a more visible disease, and it turns out that this is what we see in the data. So if you look at people with type 2 and you cut them by the different therapies that they use, it turns out that people not on insulin, only about 49% of them say, yeah, I feel stigmatized. If you look at people on insulin, 55% say they feel stigmatized. And then if you look at type 2s on intensive insulin therapy, so multiple injections a day, 
61% feel stigmatized, right? So this now starts to look a lot more like type 1, which is really, really interesting, right? So do type 1s and type 2s feel the same amount of stigma? It gets at this idea of visibility. How visible is it? How, how deviant are you from the culturally defined norm? And now this is the other really interesting cut of the data. Parents of type 1s feel enormously stigmatized. 83%. Right? So they feel this incredible stigma attached with managing this daily 24-7 condition. Uh, and they're not even the ones that have diabetes, right? So we, we did ask parents of ch so children didn't take the survey, their parents did though. So, and they were supposed to respond for their children, but presumably some of their own stigmatization, you know, dipped into this. What are the most widely reported forms of stigma. So what does stigma look like? This is something Virginia Valentine talks about a lot. Perception of a character flaw, failing personal responsibility. This is all respondents, right? So 81% feel like diabetes is like a character flaw. It's like I'm failing. 65% say diabetes, I'm putting a burden on the healthcare system, right? I'm expensive, I cost more. And I think these aren't really that surprising, right? The way that we talk about diabetes, the way that we, you know, patients fail a therapy and then we add another therapy and they fail that and we add another. Um, the, all the talk in the media about costs and how expensive diabetes is and how we need to reduce costs. So, you know, there, there's a lot to unpack here in, in terms of stigma. Here's some of the direct verbatim quotes that came from patients, right, that they hear people say. Fat and lazy and overeat all the time. It's always the person's fault for being overweight and eating too much sweets and candy. And we know from obesity research this is flat out not true. It is flat out not true that there is a lot more to the biology of being overweight than just someone being uh, lazy or just making bad choices, right? There's a lot of biology underlying obesity that we still don't understand. Insurers don't like diabetics due to perceived cost to them, right? So this is the kind of things that people feel like when they're, they're carrying around this, this condition with them. This one's the worst, right? I have been fired for having diabetes. People act like diabetes is contagious. I've had boyfriends break up with me. People act like I have the plague. So is it any surprise that people with diabetes hide the fact that they have diabetes, right? When this is people's experience, it's ludicrous. And then we ask, how have other people's perceptions about your diabetes impacted your emotional life? You know, so the, these kinds of images like feeling guilt, feeling shame or blame or embarrassment or isolation. How, how often do you feel that? And so the next few slides are going to show on a scale of 1 to 10, people said, yeah, I'm about, you know, nine, I'm a 9 out of 10 in terms of feeling these negative emotions. And it's going to show the percent of people, and I'm going to break it down by different classes. So here's the most, so on the x-axis is the different types, right? So type 2, not on insulin, type 2 on insulin, intensive insulin, type 1. And then on the y-axis is the, the number, the percent of people who said, I'm a 9 or 10, feeling guilt, shame, blame. So it's a very stringent definition, right? I'm a 9 or 10 and feeling guilt, shame, or blame. And it's the same thing I showed you earlier. The more intense your therapy, the more guilt you feel, the more shame, the more blame, the more embarrassment, and the more isolation. Does this surprise anyone? Yeah, all right, kind of makes sense. So this is, um, this is some work that I feel really, really strongly about. And so the, in working in diabetes in the past six years, I've learned a lot about all the things that impact blood sugar. And I, I write a column in Diatribe called Adam's Corner, and, and in it I, I talk about my experience living with diabetes, I try to share actionable tips. And so people, people would come up to me and say, you know, I'm having so much challenge with my diabetes, and um, you know, I feel like I eat and I exercise and I test my blood sugar and I take my medication, and it, it just doesn't, I, my blood sugars aren't in, in range, and, it, and it's not fair. And I tell them, not every blood sugar is in your control because look at all the things that impact blood sugar, right? And this is a partial list, okay? So after I published this, I probably had another eight or ten things people sent me. So this is not a disease that is in patient's control. And I think this is exactly what drives people on intensive therapy to feel guilt and shame and blame and crappy and like they're failing. 
This is what a, a driver on the way to, to the airport told me. This is a guy who has blood sugars in the 300s. He already has kidney problems. Uh, his doctor didn't know he was on insulin. He's been on insulin for two years because his pharmacist manages his insulin. Uh, a guy that can't exercise because he drives a car 14, 15 hours a day. His family gives him no support. His son gives him a hard time for not exercising. And this is what he told me. You know, diabetes can be depressing to feel like you've done everything right and still get a 225 on the meter. And here's the most interesting thing about this guy. I sat in the back of the cab and I said, I'm gonna help this guy because I know a lot about diabetes and I'm gonna give him actionable tips. So I got his email and I, I brainstormed for three days and I was like, what are the three most important things I'm gonna tell this guy? And I sent him an email and guess what happened? He didn't respond. <laughs> and I was like, all right, I'm not going to take no for an answer. So I, I marked on my calendar, I set a reminder for two weeks later, and I said, I'm going to email him again. And I emailed him again, and guess what happened? He didn't respond, right? <laughs> so this is stigma, right? He doesn't want to own diabetes. He doesn't want to talk about it with his family. He doesn't want to talk about it with me. And so he, he told me, he, he drinks regular soda and eats fried chicken every single day. That's what he told me on this cab ride. And, and I think this is, this is the challenge ahead of us, right? To crack stigma. And I think, I think we can do it, but it's, there's a lot here. So here's some other cuts of the data. So more intense therapy, more stigma. Uh, more feelings of guilt, shame, blame, embarrassment, isolation. Females feel a lot more of these negative feelings than males by a pretty healthy margin. So it's almost double in type 2 and a fair amount greater in type 1, which is really interesting. This is one, the, the next two are scary, right? So people who are doing badly, so they have an A1C over 9%. And let's compare them to people who have an A1C less than 6%. So they're, they're doing incredibly well by at least the standard of A1C. Look at how much more guilt and shame and blame and crappiness people with an A1C of 9% feel relative to people with an A1C under 6, whether it's type 2 or type 1. Way more, you feel way more negative feelings when you have a really terrible A1C. Same exact thing with BMI. If your BMI is over 35 versus under 25, one and a half to two times the guilt and shame and blame this really, really bothers me. I'm in poor control versus I'm in excellent control. Same thing. Almost three, time, three times the amount of negative feelings in type 2 and almost double that amount in type 1. So more intense therapy if you're female. If you have a higher BMI, a higher A1C, and poorer self-reported control, you feel these really negative, crappy feelings. And you know, you know, what that says to me, and is I think one of the most important takeaways of this talk is the people most in need of our help are the most impacted by stigma. And that sucks. So we have a lot of work to do to improve this. And uh, I want you to read this box and then think about, is this, are these people, these are verbatim responses that of people saying, I wish, dot, dot, dot. Here's verbatim responses. Do you think this box is type one or type two? Type one? Type two. Okay, now read this box. Type one? Type two. Okay, they're all type two. Right? How mind-blowing is that? Verbatim. How do we reduce stigma? Here's what people said. Increase public knowledge about what causes diabetes. It's, it is ridiculous what people say about what causes diabetes. Increase education. This is your bread and butter, right? So we need to tell people how, how this disease actually works, what the different therapies are. Interesting, 19% of type 1 say we should actually change the wording. And this is what was an interesting nuance in the data, which is 
a lot of people with type 1 feel stigma because they feel like they're being misrecognized as a type 2. And so they want to distance themselves from type 2. No type 2s, by the way, suggested that. So that's, that's an interesting, I think, takeaway. If there were one thing you would do to reduce the stigma, what would it be? Enlighten people. This is so difficult to live with, right? Go back to that, that factors page I showed you. Counter the false claims that we see on advertising, you know, that cinnamon is going to cure your diabetes. Uh, teach children in schools like we do for HIV and other things, you know, what, what, is the, what is really happening with diabetes? What does it mean? Nationwide PSAs, right? Where's the Super Bowl commercials on diabetes and, and really going full tilt at this? So, disturbingly high number of people with diabetes experience stigma, and it's worse if your therapy is more intensive for females and for parents. This impacts people doing badly way more than people doing really well. So, worse self-reported control, higher BMI, higher A1C. The people who most need our help are the people most uh, impacted by stigma. And we can all do, I think, a much better job of, of educating the public about this. Limitations, obviously this is self-reported data, it was an online survey, not enough ethnic diversity, I think these are sort of the standard limitations, but at least we have some data on stigma now. And, and Susan was pointing out, maybe these is, this is under-reporting just because of the people likely to take a survey online. Um, lots of future questions, how is stigma different in type 1 and type 2, how does it impact daily life, what therapies actually reduce these crappy feelings that people feel, how do we reduce failure and guilt? I've written a lot about this in Diatribe. Um, I think just ch sharing with people how much affects blood sugar, I think is like such a massive thing to give people a sense of relief. So if you wanna sign up for the Diabetes Educator Panel, so DQNA does have a panel for diabetes educators to answer questions, you can email Richard Wood. It's richard.wood at d-qa.com. And please tell your patients about Diatribe. I promise it's free. We don't do advertising. We really care about improving the lives of people with diabetes. Uh, and with that, uh, my name's Adam. You can email me at adam at diatribe.org if you want the slides or um, tweet at me. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Susan.